Guys, silence. I want to introduce Carolyn Fisher. Thanks, Thomas. Um, so for those of you who know me, I've been gathering several affiliations lately. But I think the most relevant one is this year I've been the Marx Visiting Professor here at Gothenburg University. And I've really been able to witness just how great a group there is here, what a strong department, and also all the amazing effort that has gone into organizing this conference. So I just wanted to acknowledge my local colleagues. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of announcements um, just before we forget. So as yesterday, for those of you attending scheduled meetings at lunch, there are a lot of editorial board meetings today. You can go straight to your rooms and there will be lunch boxes available there. I wanted to point out that this evening there's another wonderful social event. It's at Handel's and you've got uh, a bunch of different options. It'll go from 6.30 to about 10. There will be food and drink. Um, football, as always, is in... Haga Sapuran, um, in the courtyard, there's going to be a DJ and then some live bossa nova music. Um, and then I will be hosting an open mic in the Gothenburg room, I think eight, around 8 to 10. So uh, come on in, sign up, uh, play something, sing something, do some spoken word, you know, whatever. It'll be fun. Okay, now that that's out of the way, um, I was really thrilled to be asked to uh, introduce Meredith Fowley. She's uh, not only one of my favorite economists, but one of my favorite people. Um, she's a fellow Canadian or Canadian-American and works on all of my favorite topics <laughs> like uh, energy intensive industries, renewable energy, energy efficiency. And what I really admire about her is um, she, you know, takes what I do in theory and then goes way beyond, takes it to the data and really drills down to answer important, relevant questions in the real world. Meredith holds the Class of 1935 Distinguished Chair in Energy at UC Berkeley. She's Associate Professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics there and a Research Associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. Um, her work has appeared in AER, Journal of Political Economy, QJE, RE Stat, Jerry, all the most important journals. Um, she's co-editor at the Review of Environmental Economics and Policy, our journal. Um, and in the policy sphere, she served in an advisory capacity to the California Air Resources Board and was recently appointed by the Governor of California to serve on the state's Independent Emissions Market Advisory Committee. So uh, let's give a hand to welcome Meredith. Thanks very much, Carolyn. It means a lot, um, that introduction. Carolyn is one of my heroes, Canadian heroes, but also heroes unconditional. Um, so it is a huge honor and frankly, hugely intimidating uh, to be addressing this distinguished audience. I wanted to thank the organizers for the invitation, uh, thank them for the tremendous effort that must have been invested to make this World Congress such a success. And um, but I also want to acknowledge um, the efforts they have made and the thought they've invested uh, in uh, raising the profile of and supporting uh, research at this conference by women and other underrepresented groups. I appreciate sometimes that involves trade-offs, but I really do think, uh, continue to think it's important. Um, so we're all here in beautiful Gothenburg, Sweden. The days are long. The research talks have been really high quality and thought-provoking. The interactions have been great. My soccer, I've learned to say in Europe, football team at the World Cup is still in the game as of last night. So it's hard not to feel sort of high on life. Uh, but given the subject of my talk, which I'm, oh, it's up there, good, um, is carbon pricing in the real world, I want to sort of bring down the mood just a bit. Um, <laughs> Because the jumping off point is a pretty sobering one. Uh, looking around the room, uh, there are people who look at climate change from all different perspectives, right? So extreme weather events and their effects on economic productivity. I was in some really uh, sobering but excellent sessions at this conference thinking about extreme heat and high temperatures and impacts on health and productivity. So whatever your perspective, uh, climate change looks like a pretty wicked and complicated problem. 
And the urgency of the climate change problem really demands an effective policy response. I'm in a church of economists, but I think it's safe to say I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, and if I took a poll of this congregation um, and asked, so what should we do about it? What's the right policy response? Internalize the externality, put a price on carbon would probably be a response that you'd hear. And this is a simple and powerful and elegant idea. Um, put an economy-wide price that uh, is close to or equal to our best guess at the social cost of carbon. And that can coordinate abatement activity across thousands or millions of firms with heterogeneous and hard for policymakers to observe abatement costs. It can coordinate consumption decisions of consumers trading off between low and high carbon goods. And in the longer run, it can incentivize investment and innovation in green technologies, and that's got to be our end game when you think about the magnitude of the problem. So as you can tell, I'm a big believer in carbon pricing. I think it's the most important contribution that environmentalists have made, or environmental economists have made to the policy discourse. But I'm getting older, uh, and I'm talking to my young, fresh-faced graduate students, and my enthusiasm for carbon pricing isn't really mirrored in their young faces. They are more sort of cynical and skeptical. And I really, I think I trace my 110% all-in carbon pricing views and thought ideas back to my graduate school days. I'm going to date myself here. Um, if you, like me, were studying environmental economists in the range of sort of 200, 20, 2005, 2006, 2004, it was hard not to get swept up in the enthusiasm. So this graph on your uh, left, uh, it's sort of apologetically America-focused, um, but it's tracking the adoption of carbon pricing of states over that time period. The number of states adopting uh, the carbon tax is sort of holding steady at zero, uh, but you see this you know, tick up uh, between 2004 and 2008 with um, uh, 23 states adopting some form of carbon pricing. So it's hard not to feel like we were on like the, the sky was the limit. As an empirical economist interested in this idea, I was preparing for a tidal wave of microdata that I was going to be able to look at to understand what we were learning from these programs and try and galvanize a spread of adoption of this policy approach um, outward. The other graph is showing you this steady stream of, of uh, top journal articles. So this is not the most scientific data collection, but I grabbed from top five journals and top field journals the number of papers being published on carbon pricing and emissions pricing more generally, just trying to improve our understanding of how these policies could work um, in theory and practice. So fast forward to now, or 2015, because that's all the data I could find, and uh, what you see is this real tick up in great research thinking about carbon pricing and how, how we understand it and how we can strengthen the case for it. I tried to count the number of papers on the program that fall into this space, and the, there's too many to count. Just, there's been an explosion of scholarship, much of it policy-facing, trying to improve our understanding of these, of these policy approaches, and that's exciting. But in the US and Canada, the areas I'm most familiar with, it's been really hard to transfer these ideas from good journal articles to implementing agencies to on-the-ground policy applications. The enthusiasm we have for these ideas is not as compelling um, in a policy arena when weighed against political realities. So in the US, 13 of those states that jumped on the bandwagon while I was a graduate student jumped off and said, you know what, we're going to abandon uh, this idea, at least for now. So now we're down to 13 states and sort of in that holding pattern. So taking a more global, view, global view, this is um, maps from the World Bank. We're seeing important progress. Uh, this map shows uh, jurisdictions that have adopted some form of carbon pricing. The green is emissions trading programs, and the blue is carbon taxes. And we're up to 14%. That number is hard to estimate, but roughly in that neighborhood. Much of that coming from emissions trading programs. So that's a milestone, but clearly we've, we've got to push forward. So what I wanted to do with my limited time is talk about some of the ways that economics research has pushed this policy ball forward, That's sort of the glass half full view. And then, I mean, I'm trying to channel Gina McCarthy's like rousing don't mope speech, and I don't think I'm moping, but I am introspective, right? Because the dismantling of Obama's climate change policy agenda over the last few months. I'm a Canadian from Ontario. We just elected a, a premier who campaigned as an anti-carbon pricing populist and declared that his first act would be to pull Ontario out of the cap and trade program it had pre previously con sort of committed to participating in. So uh, this, these kinds of events have me thinking also about the impact we haven't had 
as economic researchers and um, thinking a little bit about how we might shift our emphasis approach a bit to be more effective in shaping real world policy outcomes, but still remaining true to our academic scholarly imperatives. So I wanted to highlight three comparative advantages I see. This is not an exhaustive list, it's just one I chose to highlight in 40 minutes or less. Um, one is we think a lot about causal inference, right? We think we lose sleep over threats to validity and the assumptions we need to invoke to draw sort of causal inference from data, and that positions us really well to get into the discussion about what impacts these policies are having. Second, we're really good at thinking about modeling complex economic interactions in markets and bringing theory and applying it to excellent, inform excellent empirical work. And there again, these markets are complicated. Different stakeholders are taking different ideas and interpretations from the market outcomes we're seeing. And I think economists have a really, are in a great position to inject themselves into that conversation and interpret um, the outcomes uh, in a way that's theoretically consistent and well-founded. And finally, for the foreseeable future, carbon pricing policies are going to be second or third or fourth best. And we think a lot, especially in this room, about second, third, fourth best policy design. And so I think that uh, it's kind of an all hands on deck situation and we need all the tools and methods we have uh, to apply to carbon pricing. Okay, so let's start with uh, causal inference. We think a lot about this. We have sophisticated tools that we're developing and refining. Um, and so it follows, I think, that economists are well positioned to take, some first, to take on some of these like first order high stakes causal questions. One has been around for a while, and that is you know, what impacts are these pricing, emissions pricing programs having on outcomes that we're interested in? This is an old quote. It's not about carbon pricing. It's about a regional NOx market. It's from an EPA document, sort of an oldie but goodie, 2002. And the quote reads, how have actual emissions reductions under cap and trade compared to those that would have occurred under business as usual? While there can be no definitive answer, this question is so central to the affected public in any area thinking about moving towards it that we're obligated to try and answer it. So I think as experience with emissions trading programs accumulate, we're getting years upon years of micro data, it becomes possible in principle to take our quasi-experimental causal inference tools and start to address these causal questions. Um, and so what are we doing? This is in the words of the great, um, and we lost him last year, and it sh sure was a big loss, John DiNardo, who sort of sums up in one quote what quasi-experimental work is trying to do. Um, we're looking for serendipitous situations where assignment to treatment approximates a well-designed, randomized experiment. So when we approach these kinds of causal questions in the context of carbon markets, we realize at the outset we are going to fall so far short of this like theoretical ideal, right? Economic agents are not pea plants or whatever's going to grow in those pots. They move, they're not compliant, they're not cooperative, they interact with each other. So in the context of carbon pricing, if we're even thinking about applying quasi-experimental methods, first we need to characterize the treatment assignment mechanism. How were units assigned to the policy intervention we're interested in and how did those control units manage to be in the control group? Um, and secondly, do everything we can to characterize or, or construct the most credible counterfactual, right? Typically, we're interested in thinking about, you know, those regulated firms, what outcomes would we observe if we never implemented this carbon policy? You can already see a level of discomfort in the room from some people who think about, you know, uh, very clean and neat identification problems. There are so many ways that these comparisons depart from the ideal, right? So I do think it's important to highlight those, but rather than beat up on some of the excellent work that's focusing on carbon pricing, I'm going to beat up on my own paper. It was a couple years old where we approached, we sort of waded into the shallow end of this causal inference question and thought about an emissions trading program that wasn't carbon, it was um, nox, nitrogen oxides in Southern California. It's a very quick introduction. What was this market? Air quality is really bad in 1990. And so just at a loss of what to do, the Air Quality Management District decided to experiment with cap and trade. So that blue area there is the Air Quality Management District. So thinking about the treatment assignment mechanism in this context, you were treated, you were regulated in this program if you're operating in that blue piece of California and your historic emissions had exceeded some historic threshold. You are not regulated if you are operating outside that blue area or if you're inside the Air Quality Management District but below that emissions threshold. 
So that gives us two sort of footholds for possible identification, right? We've got two potential control groups, observationally similar plants that look a lot like the regulated plants, but they're outside of Squawk the South Coast Air Quality Management District, or really, really similar plants that are in that district but are just on the low side of the threshold. So our strategy was to exploit both of those thresholds to construct the best possible comparison group. Now we lost sleep, lots of sleep, very aware that the, some of the assumptions we would need to invoke to interpret those comparisons between treated and control, regulated and unregulated groups as causal were going to be hard to defend in practice, right? So one is the conditional unconfoundedness, that there was no unobserved stuff, that even though we're controlling on pretrends and all sorts of observable factors, unobservable factors that would generate different outcomes post-policy introduction, independent of the policy. But I think the big assumption uh, for people who work on these types of questions using these types of methods, affectionately or unaffectionately known as SUTPA, the stable unit treatment value assumption, basically what you have to assume when you're comparing regulated and unregulated plants and saying, I'm going to think of this difference as a, as a measure, an unbiased measure of the causal impact of this policy, what you're assuming is those unregulated plants are unaffected by the treatment, even indirectly. So imagine I'm a regulated glass manufacturer and Maureen is unregulated. Um, Maureen is unregulated, but she's, if, if she's matched with me, she's interacting in the same product market, and my costs just went up. So she's got, you know, she just enjoyed a cost advantage, and we might see production shift to her. Or perhaps she consumes as inputs to production factors of production that are affected by that policy. So she's indirectly regulated or indirectly affected by that regulation through increased output prices. So you think hard enough and you can start to see a number of ways that that SUTPA violation is violated. And then you've got to make a judgment call. Is this just not worth doing? <laughs> or do we uh, remain very cognizant of the assumptions we're violating but move forward? Reveal, we persisted, we wrote the paper, and the reason we did it was because conversation between co-authors, if we don't do this, there's kind of a vacuum that's going to be filled with less careful estimates. Proponents of the policy saying there's huge impacts, opponents of the policy saying there's no impacts, so we decided to wade in there, waving all sorts of econometrician caveat flags about the assumptions one would need to make to interpret our estimates as causal. So quickly to summarize, we found a 20% reduction in the, un in the regulated plants versus the matched counterparts. And then we thought about all sorts of the violations, channels and spillovers that we might be worried about, and thought about different subsets of the control group that might be more or less affected by those spillovers, and re-estimated our comparisons using those subsets, just to see how robust our estimates were to these different subgroups, and they're relatively robust. So now let's turn our attention to a similar causal question, much higher stakes, the impacts of carbon pricing, with more than 15 years of microdata from the EU's emissions trading system, we're starting to see in the pipeline, including at this conference, really nice papers using precisely the strategy that I described, but refined and improved and more sophisticated. So for those of you who are not familiar with the EU emissions trading system, I'll give you like a 10 second update. 31 countries, 12,000 covered installations, about 8,000 firms, roughly 40% of European greenhouse gas emissions covered. And over the time frame of the policy, we've seen a 15% reduction in regulated emissions. But of course, lots of other things are happening during that time frame. So the challenge is to disentangle the effect of the EU ATS from the effect of these other factors. Now, what's the toehold? What's the, like, the, 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 the policy design feature that these Right, these analysts can sort of latch on to to try and get a basis for inference or a basis for constructing a control group. Well, in the EU ETS, in every sector, there's a capacity threshold. And if you're over it, you're in the EU ETS, and if you're under it, you're not. So that's the hook. And so uh, researchers, including many in this room, have been carefully matching using semi-parametric matching estimates and adjusting for matching imperfect matches to try and isolate the firms on the other side of the capacity threshold that look as similar to the firms on the upper end of the threshold. Now think a little, and there's a number of ways that we worry about spillovers. I think there are actually some additional ways here that we didn't have to wrestle with in our earlier work. But again, I come back to like, if we don't do this careful analysis and carefully interpret the results, I think that um, policymakers will have less careful um, work to, to work with when they're trying to understand what's happening. So doing no justice to the amazing work that's coming through the pipeline, I'm going to sort of rapid fire go through some of the papers I've collected with apologies to those of you who should be here and aren't. So we're seeing early evidence on emissions impacts. And here what I mean is comparing 
regulated EU ETS firms to observ observably similar counterparts. And we're seeing uh, some papers failing to reject the null of no difference between regulated and unregulated firms, but two papers presented at this conference finding positive effects. Although notably, uh, the paper looking at French firms doesn't find effects for partially regulated firms, which suggests some spillovers sort of within firms moving production from um, regulated to unregulated uh, entities. Evidence on innovation. So there's related work. You know, the end game has to be we need to develop policies to incentivize innovation and development of cleaner technologies. So there is some work trying to look to see same strategy, but, but now the outcome is patenting activity. Now here it's tricky, right? Because when you impose a price on carbon, everyone has an increased incentive to invest in patenting behavior, not just the regulated firms. But you can tell a story that maybe the incentives are stronger among regulated firms. So taking that story and running with it, we've got a couple of papers that find economically significant differences in patenting activity across regulated and matched uh, unregulated firms. And finally, you know, I know that I'm missing papers here, but a number of papers, including some presented at workshops and conference sessions here, looking at uh, impacts on labor, demand, investment, uh, production efficiency. And from my sort of step, take, take a step back view, we're not finding significant negative impacts. Oftentimes, we're failing to reject the null of no difference. And some early studies suggesting that, if anything, we're seeing sort of increase in revenues or increase in investments in fixed assets among the regulated plants. So I think what I take away from this is ex post evidence on these policy impacts is powerful even if it's not perfect. Um, it's not going to lead to the final word on causal impacts, but I think it helps us understand the evidence that's coming out of these policies. Um, I'm, you're, what you're seeing is more work trying to unpack the mechanisms, so what explains different outcomes across these studies, what explains unexpected um, estimates of increases in, in productivity or revenue. And finally, you're seeing more work. I'm going to plug a paper I read on the plane, but there are more, uh, written by Kyle Meng and Olivier Deschens. It's kind of trying to extend the potential outcome framework to explicitly distinguish between individual and group level treatment effects and really elucidate our thinking about what we're doing when you're, you're applying these quasi-experimental methods to these kind of um, policy experiment uh, settings. Okay, so that's comparative advantage number one. Um, now I want to talk about um, the second area of research that thinks about uh, modeling complex market interactions um, and trying to understand and interpret what we're seeing in these markets. So what I'm showing you here um, is sort of a medley of uh, price, carbon price signals from big carbon markets, the EU, California, down here the price has been near the floor since the beginning of the program, and the regional greenhouse gas um, in initiatives market. The font is so small you probably can't see it, but rest it, like these are low prices. So in California, you know, $12, $15. In Europe, the price has been around uh, below 10 euros, although it's kicked up since a recent announcement of, of market, new market rules. So there's a growing literature that I think is quite exciting that's trying to interpret, like, explain why the price is so low and some of the um, dynamics and, and price paths that we're observing, especially some of the volatility in some of these markets. So in some respects, this could not be a more basic question, like what determines the price? The intersection of supply and demand, right? And what are we thinking about here? It's the supply of abatement which, you know, what, how much abatement do firms bring to the market at a given um, permit price and determines are going to be things like fuel costs, technology, other policies mandating different abatement options be deployed uh, with or without the permit market. What explains demand for abatement? It's business as usual, effectively known as BAU, minus the cap. And what determines that? Economic growth, vehicle miles traveled, weather, fuel prices, all sorts of stuff. So we're try there's a number of papers really digging into you know, what explains the prices we're seeing. I want to shift the focus from Europe to my home state of California. So the 10 second introduction to the California market, multi-sector cap and trade program, about 450 businesses, 85% of emissions, so larger scope, partly because we bring in transportation fuels. When people talk about uh, California's market, we often talk about cap and trade being the centerpiece of our sort of suite or medley of policies, that's a little misleading or potentially misleading. This is a figure, thanks to um, Amelia Keys and uh, Dallas Bertra of RFF, who are summarizing the implementing agency's best ex-ante guess of what contribution the cap and trade program would make to reducing emissions versus some of the other policies we're pushing in there. And what you can see is their best guess is that cap and trade will contribute, you know, 20, 25, 30 percent of the reductions. All the other abatement is being mandated with you know, fuel efficiency standards and energy efficiency rebates and renewable portfolio standards and you name it, 
we got it. Um, now, I should say Californians tend to be optimistic, <laughs> so I think that the, the height of some of these bars are probably over, overly optimistic in terms of how much uh, emissions abatement is being pushed in by these policies, but you should think of cap and trade as like a belt. It's ensuring we, we meet our cap, and if some of these complementary policies fall short of expectations, it's there to ensure that we don't blow through the emissions target. So um, some colleagues of, of mine at, um, in, at UC Davis, Jim Bushnell, Severin Bornstein, Frank Wallach of Stanford, and Matt Zaragoza Watkins, who's here, what they wanted to do is they wanted to model and understand both abatement supply and demand during the first compliance period of California's market, which is 2013 to 2020. So let's start with demand, which as we talked about, we can think about it as business as usual emissions less the cap. The cap is a number. The cap is just chosen by the governor or the governor's staffers or whatever political process spits out the cap. When we analyze these policies, we often think of business as usual as a number, but it is not a number, <laughs> right? It's a distribution. Thinking of all the factors that determine business as usual emissions, it's actually a fairly, can be a fairly broad range of possible realizations. And so what this paper does, and it's the first paper I know to, to do this, is quantify the uncertainty around that business as usual number based on information that's available ex ante. So ex ante for the purposes of this paper is 2010. And so to derive their estimate of that distribution, they're gonna estimate a vector autoregression model using determinants of California state emissions, the big ones, like vehicle miles traveled and the, energy the emissions intensity of electricity generation, gross state product, et cetera. They use all the ex ante available information that they can to estimate this probability density of future greenhouse gas emissions given pre-existing trends in the drivers of, of state level emissions. And so what you can see in this, in this slide is you know, two different approaches that they use. They use multiple if you dive into the appendix. The solid line is the state's emissions going forward. That tiny blue line, which you can sort of barely seen as my addition to this graph, which is the 2020 greenhouse gas emissions target that California has imposed. And what you can see is really wide distribution of possible outcomes as you get out towards 2020. And in expectation, you know, for many of those realizations, we're gonna come in under that target. Okay, so then what they're gonna do, and I apologize for the sort of hokey graphic, but I realized this morning that it might help in sort of explaining my points here. We've got this distribution of business as usual emissions and we're gonna be able to subtract the cap from that to get a distribution of the demand for abatement in this California market over this first phase. And now what they're gonna to add to that to try and understand sort of where the price is gonna fall is some model of abatement supply. So where does abatement supply come from in California? First, it's driven by the market, right? If the price is high enough, I'm a firm and I'm gonna come in and deliver abatement if the price is right. And second, you've got all those mandated, I used to call them complementary, but Dallas Bertra has started a rebranding campaign to call them companion policies, and I'm totally on board, so I will try and use that term. Companion policies, these are the fuel efficiency standards and the energy efficiency standards and the renewable mandates that are pushing abatement into the market. So what does that do to the abatement supply curve? It pushes a bunch of abatement in at zero price. Regardless of what the permit price is, that abatement is mandated to be there, so that's gonna shift it out. And this is where my graphics in PowerPoint skills are particularly bad. If you pulse, if you mandate some of the abatement that's cost effective over the range that's relevant for this cap, you're gonna make that abatement supply curve steeper. Right? It's gonna become more inelastic um, as a consequence of, of, of taking out some of the cost effective abatement and pushing it in to the market. Okay, so what are they gonna do in this paper? They're gonna, they're gonna interact the distribution of uh, demand for abatement, which again is that distribution of business as usual emissions less the cap with the abatement supply curve and come up with predictions about where these permit prices, um, we should expect them to be given what we think we understand about this market. And they protect, project that with 95% probability, the price is gonna be at the floor, which is exactly what we've seen in the market to date. 1% chance of being on that sloped part of the uh, curve, right? So between the floor and what we'll call for the purpose of this presentation, the ceiling, and a 4% chance of hitting the ceiling. So one of the questions you wanna ask, or at least what I wanna know from this paper is, well, but how much of that is because of all those companion policies we're pushing in? So it's hard to like remove the effects of companion policies from their business as usual estimates, but they do their, their best. And so I think I would interpret their results are if you, re if you reduce the role of companion policies, maybe not perfectly eliminate them in this paper, you see a substantially smaller chance of the market price at the floor and a much larger probability of an interior solution. 
So what does that imply for companion policies? So these policies are driving down permit prices. And if you talk to policymakers nervous about high prices, that's, that's comforting to them because they are, they are uh, apprehensive about a political reaction to a high price. They take elasticity out of the abatement supply curve, which hasn't been an issue so far, but will be as our ambition increases. Policies that mandate relatively um, expensive options are increasing the cost of meeting the cap. Right? We're pushing in more expensive options and not letting the, the permit market do its job to seek out the low-hanging fruit, so to speak. So one question we should be asking is, what are these companion policies and how cost-effective are they? There's been many studies in this area. I'm not going to survey all of them. Um, but I did, the, in general, we keep looking for winners, but in general, these policies are generally found to be more costly per unit of CO2 avoided when you measure the costs and benefits we can measure with our tools, right? And so we've got a number of papers looking at EV subsidies and fuel efficiency standards. This graph summarizes estimates from two independent studies, one that I worked on, one that Danny Ellerman and Marco Tonini worked on, that asked the following question. In both Europe and the US, we see this overlapping policies, overlap between an emissions trading program, a price of carbon, and renewables mandates, renewable portfolio standards, renewable subsidies, et cetera. So you can use, you can use the data you can observe in terms of uh, um, operating costs and investment costs and uh, emissions from conventional generation to estimate the marginal benefits from deploying more renewables, compare that with estimated costs, and come up with an estimate of how, how much are we paying per ton of CO2 we're displacing with renewable subsidies versus the permit price that we see prevailing in the market. And what you see across these two studies is quite surprisingly similar. Those yellow bars are our best estimate of the marginal, you know, of the cost per ton of CO2 displaced by the marginal unit of solar PV we're pushing into the market. Wind looks better, but the blue bar you can't even see is the permit price that prevailed uh, during this time period, which really suggests that these, you know, these marginal abatement costs are not set equal across the permit market, what the permit market can find, and the policies we're pushing in. So with mounting evidence that these companion policies are pushing this high cost abatement into the markets, economists are raising concerns about cost effectiveness. Um, but these concerns notwithstanding, uh, the politics continue to favor these other policies. So what I've added to that first graph I showed you, these are states adopting carbon pricing, and you see that dip down as states abandon carbon pricing, but the blue line is renewable portfolio standards, and that's just marching on up, including some very conservative states. So I think political durability is not a reason for economists to sort of accept the shortcomings of these policies or stop doing research that highlights cost ineffectiveness or perverse uh, impacts or trade-offs that we're making. But uh, I do think that when you're writing these papers, and I have written a couple of them, where you're studying a companion policy that you wanted to work and in fact it's not looking good, one ending to that paper is tax carbon amen. This is just not cost effective. Um, but I think another one, and, and there are some policies that are just so, so cost ineffective or so flawed that it's going to be hard to imagine how to fix them. But I think that other policies that we could live with, you know, policies that are not first best cost effective but are in the realm or in the area of cost effectiveness that you could imagine it's worth improving them to try and deliver uh, abatement, uh, greenhouse gas abatement, given all the political challenges. I think we can be constructive in trying to think about, you know, yes, they're, they're not our first best, but here are some ways to improve the, the um, efficiency properties of these policies. My concern, and this is I speak for myself, we can look a little tone deaf uh, when we write papers about renewable supports and say this is not cost effective, so we should just rely entirely on a, on a carbon price. So I think it's exciting to see a number of papers coming through with these sort of companion policies and thinking hard about how we can improve them. Okay, so to my last um, comparative advantage or advantage that I think economists have. Um, and this is thinking about optimal policy design in second best settings. Um, so if you think about uh, so far, we've focused on existing emissions trading programs and we've focused on research that really looks into those areas with carbon pricing regimes and tries to unpack and understand the outcomes, the causal impacts, what's driving market outcomes and what you know, our, our lessons learned from market analysis implies for policy design going forward. But of course, it's essential to remember that these programs cover only 14%, and that leaves 86% uncovered. In a talk this short, I'm not going to talk about sort of the other leg of the stool, which is thinking about developing and emerging economies and the types of interventions and policies we should be thinking about uh, to help strike balances between development and carbon mitigation. 
Those are important, but what I want to focus on today is if you are a jurisdiction implementing a carbon pricing program, how do you account for the fact that a majority of the greenhouse gas emissions are uncovered by these programs? So uh, the term leakage, some of you may be familiar, some familiar with it, um, others not. Emissions leakage and rent leakage are issues that loom, loom really large in policy debates in jurisdictions that are trying to implement these incomplete policies. So what's the problem? It's probably obvious, but let's just spell it out. Carbon greenhouse gases are a global pollutant, right? The climate damages don't are the same whether it's emitted in California or Canada or China or wherever in the world you can imagine it would be emitted. And this poses real challenges for incomplete policies that regulate only a subset of the sources that contribute to the larger problem. So you think, think in California, I'm a glass manufacturer. The governor has decided to put a price on carbon. My prices increase relative to my unregulated rivals. And there's a real concern that I'm going to lose market share. We're going to see a shift in economic activity from the regulated region to those unregulated entities, and potentially a shift in associated emissions. So concerns about emissions leakage are big, and I think addressing to the best of our ability the carbon leakage problem is essential if we want to expand the scope of carbon regulation and if we want to support higher levels of carbon pricing. Absent these second best policies to deal with the leakage mitigation problem, I think the fallback will be a low carbon price or no carbon price. So punchline is policymakers are looking to strike a balance between creating incentives that incentivize emissions reductions in their own jurisdictions, but mitigates leakage to the, regulate, the jurisdictions they can't directly regulate. To state the obvious in this crowd, but it's not always obvious to policymakers, the optimal level of leakage is not zero, right? We're going to want to accept some leakage in exchange for emissions reductions at home. Okay, so how can we design these programs that efficiently mitigate leakage? Um, I think if you, as, as, if you give an economist a well-defined objective function and some constraints, she can work hard to optimize it and design a policy that strikes these delicate balances. I think a lesson I've taken from my own work where we've applied sort of economics tools is that I, to be policy, directly policy relevant, I think these designs must be tempered against political constraints and implementation sort of limitations. We'll talk a little bit about um, how that might work. But first, what I wanted to do for those of you who haven't thought a great deal or read, dove into the literature on leakage, although I highly recommend it, um, is what we think we know about uh, leakage potential. So if you look at the literature that estimates, you know, how worried should we be about this emissions leakage issue, the bulk of the evidence is coming to us from CGE modeling. And I really envy my CGE modeling friends because these models are like the perfect tool. Um, they are grounded in economic theory, you can calibrate them to data, and perhaps most importantly, their general equilibrium, right? So all the channels and general equilibrium relationships we worry about in terms of determining the extent of leakage that's going to occur, not only through trade channels, but also through fuel price channels, right? When Europe puts a price on carbon, it reduces its demand for energy and emissions intensive inputs, that reduces global energy prices and leakage could occur through increased demand in other jurisdictions. So these CG models can at least in principle capture all that in one beautiful model. And so uh, there's lots of papers that have been written and a recent review that I quite like, uh, Nick Rivers and um, Jared Carbone sort of took 50 plus CG papers and said, what is it telling us about all sorts of outcomes, including leakage? And this graph I took from their nice paper. And every dot is you know, a leakage rate prediction from a CGE model. And here leakage rate is measured in terms of like what share of the emissions are you reducing in your program? leak outside. And the horizontal axis is the abatement by coalition, like how big are we talking about a teeny tiny country or a coalition of countries that represent a larger share. And so what you see is first the estimates typically in the range of 5 to 30 percent, which is economically significant. What they call non-standard um, CG models is important here, and those are models that depart from standard assumptions about the structure of industries and the structure of trade relationships that can make these CGE models quite tractable but can move them away in significant ways from the structure of the industries we're actually interested in and concerned about. So one point I wanted to flag here is some of those dots that predict quite high leakage rates 
are those studies that are trying to release the standard assumptions and incorporate structural assumptions that more closely resemble the emissions intensive and trade, in, trade intensive industries that we're concerned about. So what we took, I, I don't have CG modeling skills, I wish I had them, I don't, so what we take away from them as, as researchers using other tools is there is need for complementary work that tries to bring this kind of analysis closer to the, you know, incorporate some of the salient structural features of the industries we're concerned about and bring in more empirical data from those industries. So that that is what got Marwant, Steve Ryan, and, and myself interested in a project that took longer than we thought, uh, but we were happy we did it. Um, a detailed uh, paper written on one industry, in particular the cement sector in the US. So the policy scenario we're considering here, willing suspension of disbelief fantasy world, the US is implementing a carbon price. Um, and we're gonna focus on the cement industry for a number of reasons. One, it is really emissions intensive. So full inter internalization of the externality would significantly increase operating costs, like double um, in these industries, depending on your thinking about where that price should be, of course. Industry structure, really important. So the US cement industry is this interesting like patchwork of fragmented, concentrated real, uh, uh, regional markets. Reason being, it's really expensive to stick cement on a truck and ship it long distances. It gets hard and not very valuable if you send it too far. Um, industry dynamics are important. So here's an industry where abatement is gonna happen less through sort of quick, short run, changes from high, intense, high emissions to low emissions inputs, and more like long run dynamic investments in capital equipment, uh, you know, downsizing, new entry, et cetera. And finally, the potential for leakage is significant, which may seem inconsistent with what I just told you about sticking cement on a truck, but it turns out sticking cement on a boat is a whole different story, and you can actually ship it. And um, in recent years, we've seen 20% of domestic imports, um, or of imports from other countries um, in, in the US. Okay, so what do we do? We sit down and we write a down a model that's really trying to capture the salient structural features of this industry that we think is gonna matter, that could determine how firms in the industry res respond to a carbon price. So a dynamic oligopoly model to capture both static and dynamic. So short run production decisions, but long run entry, exit, investment, disinvestment um, responses. We consider this incomplete carbon price, so carbon price in the US, no carbon price outside, and we consider four different policy designs that we thought were quite policy relevant. Auction permits to the highest bidder, we see ex examples of that. Grandfathering, so handout permits in lump sum transfers. So look at some historic predetermined characteristic of the firm and that determines their allocation. Third, border tax adjustments, so auction off permits, but not quite, but stand at the border and levy a tax on the carbon embodied in the imports that are coming across the border. We're not seeing that yet for legal and trade protectionist reasons, although Carolyn Fisher's on the case, so I wouldn't underestimate her convincing the powers that be that that's the way we should go. And finally, we wanted to look at output-based updating. This is actually an approach that is happening now, and it requires a little bit of explanation. So imagine you're a cement producer. You get tax for every ton of, of emissions you emit. But for every ton of cement you produce, you get free permits, a fixed number of free permits per ton. So you've got this implicit subsidy on output. So you're taxing the bad, but you're incentivizing the good with this free transfer of permits that's conditional on um, production. So three years of work and two slides. Um, I wanted to hit, highlight the key points, especially the ones that are most relevant for this talk. So we, look, we, we can simulate emissions leakage, right? We can simulate how the industry structure evolves and production responses respond to these different policy designs over a range of carbon prices. So what you're seeing is leakage, annual leakage, over a zero to 60 carbon price for these different policy designs. The top line is auctioning, right? So it's, the firms have to pay, uh, purchase the permits and they get no compensation. So you see increasing leakage as the price gets higher and plants shut down and pull out of the market or scale back production. Under grandfathering, in a static model, we have an independence property, right? It doesn't matter how you allocate the permits, production decisions should be independent, but not in a dynamic scenario where a free allocation of permits could make the difference between firms and exiting or, 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 under invest, or disinvesting. So you see some mitigation of leakage there. The, the border tax adjustment, that's kind of a counterintuitive result. I won't spend too much time, but if you're curious, we see negative leakage with the border tax adjustment, and that's an artifact of our assumptions about the domestic market being imperfectly competitive, but import supply being competitive. So the same carbon price, you're gonna see full pass-through in the imports and incomplete pass-through, so that's kind of an artifact, but an interesting one nonetheless. 
The border tax adjustment you can see significantly mitigates the leakage with that implicit production subsidy relative to the grandfathering and auctioning designs. So then, just quickly, we can't help but do a welfare analysis, so we look at how welfare defined as domestic consumer and producer surplus, less damages from domestic emissions, less damages from emissions leaked, varies over carbon prices and across regimes. One outcome that we didn't anticipate, but we can understand why, is that over the range of, of carbon prices we evaluate, we find that full internalization of the externality would be welfare reducing. And the reason is, is that we've got a leakage problem, we've got a market power problem, the, ex the distortions associated with the exercise of market power are exacerbated with that carbon price. So you see complete internalization uh, not being welfare improving for the standard policy approaches, although for the border tax adjustment um, and the output-based updating, we cross the zero point um, towards the $50, $60 mark. So the key findings here is leakage risk um, potentially significant in the domestic sector. Policies that des designs that impose an emissions price and this implicit subsidy dominate more traditional approaches. And I think important for our purposes is you can do an optimal tax exercise here. You can think about what's the optimal tax or optimal subsidy to confer. And what we found is that the optimal sub the welfare maximizing subsidy here is economically significant and only in less than half is associated with leakage, emissions leakage mitigation. And the rest comes from sort of protectionist and market power mitigation motives. So we are excited about this. I presented it to an economic audience. They, they liked it. It's like nice application of tools. It's policy relevant. We present it to policymakers and they say, so what's the so what? <laughs> You've looked at one industry. We got 110. <laughs> so if you want to write those papers for all 110, we're all ears, um, but I'd be dead. So I think that led Mara and I to think about how can we take insights we've generated with this work and move it a little closer to the policy design challenges um, that policymakers face. So quickly, what do policymakers need? They need a lot of things, but one thing they need when it comes to leakage mitigation is a methodologically consistent, ideally transparent approach, ideally politically durable, that can be applied across all industries to figure out who's at leakage risk, and if you're one of the who, what level of subsidy it can be justified on the basis of emissions leakage mitigation. So the approach very quickly that's being taken right now across jurisdictions across the globe is let's use two metrics emissions intensity and trade exposure. Those are calibratable at the sector level using public data. So once we've figured out where you lie in that emissions intensive trade exposure space, then we're gonna sort of ad hoc assign areas of that two dimensional space to high subsidy, medium subsidy, and low subsidy. And that's gonna be the approach to allocating these subsidies. So it's, it's a jumping off point, but clearly there's, I think, room for improvement. As a, and as the stakes get higher, concerns are being raised about how, um, how effective this approach is. So what we're trying to do in work in progress, Mar and I, is go back to the drawing board and say, so let, if we were starting with a clean sheet of paper and we were writing down an economic model, what does theory imply uh, for an optimal subsidy? If the objective is to mitigate emissions leakage, and what we come up with, building on earlier excellent work by Meunier et al., is the, the subsidy is quite intuitive. You should price the emissions, but you, could, you should subsidize output according to the emissions you crowd out in foreign markets, right? So when I produce a ton of cement in California, it releases emissions, bad, but if it crowds out emissions in foreign markets, we should incentivize and reward that crowding out. So basically what the subsidy is is the foreign emissions intensity, hard to measure, but there it is, times what we're calling a market transfer rate, the rate at which production at home displaces production abroad. So you can actually reformulate that subsidy in terms of the trade, uh, the leakage uh, risk metrics that people are using. So we can at least say to policymakers, look, what you're using, these metrics, they map to our sort of micro-founded thinking about what the optimal subsidy should be. There's a trade share in there. There's something related to domestic emissions intensity in there, which is the foreign emissions intensity. But there's a missing piece. There's this responsiveness of foreign production to domestic production. And you can be very emissions intensive, but if there's no market transfer, it's hard to rationalize on the grounds of emissions leakage uh, um, uh, leakage mitigating subsidy. So the work in progress, of course, is the policymaker said that's great, but you know we can't tell a, an industry that the, the subsidy they're receiving is based on regressions run by a couple of economists somewhere in a university. So what we're trying to do now is take the results we have generated um, and think about what are observable, transparent, durable metrics that are good predictors of the scale of the subsidies we're coming up with in our work. But I said, a work in progress and welcome comments.
Okay, so I can see I'm out of time. So in closing, uh, we're not politicians, and we're not lobbyists, and we're not rock stars, although there are some rock stars here. I am not a rock star. So there's only so much we can do um, as economists to move the carbon pricing sort of ball forward. I think in several respects, we're really well positioned uh, to inform the debate. We have powerful causal inference tools. They're not perfect, this application is not perfect, but you know, good ex post work is really powerful in policy discourse. We have um, applied theory and theory models that help us understand these market interactions, help us understand what's driving them. Paired with good empirical work, we can start to think about where, which direction the policy should be heading. And for the foreseeable future, carbon pricing will be second, third, or fourth best. And we need all hands on deck, CGE models, partial equilibrium models, empirical work to try and help the whole community think about how to mitigate um, the, or ch to meet the challenge of incomplete uh, policy regulation. So with that, I'll close. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Meredith. That yeah, microphone work. So uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions, and uh, I already have a special request from Thomas Sterner, who I can't turn down. So. Lovely. Meredith, uh, that's wonderful. You are a rock star. <laughs> I, I feel so proud that we had the wisdom to, uh, to ask you to come. That was great. And I have lots of things um, I want to ask, but I'll, 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 uh, one comment and one question. Mm -hmm. so, w the comment is that Swedish cement industry and, and some other European cement industries are looking at zero emission technologies, which for cement is quite outstanding. And massive state aid, massive company investments are going into this. Mm -hmm. Completely new chemistry. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, the question relates to the slide you had with comparing the Reggie prices and the mm -hmm. solar. Can you, can you go back to that, do you think? Yeah, uh, I, think I think you're going to have to have. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. Well, this is, a, this is very strong evidence, so we have to... We can't kind of get past this, right? but I'm wondering, do those solar costs, do they really fully meet our standards of social costs? Isn't there a lot of temporary rent in there? I mean, the solar revolution will give us cheap energy forever. Mm -hmm. And we're very, it's very easy that you're counting the costs of some solar cells in Germany, which were the first ones, and so they're very heavily subsidized just to get the thing going. But then thanks to scale, technology, and, and a lot of other things, the cost, the real social costs in the long run are not like that. Yeah, or you, put differently, the social benefits aren't captured either. So in such a short talk, I should have been more explicit. These represent the cost, the short-run impacts, the costs and benefits we can measure. If a fraction of the fall in the technology costs we've seen can be attributed to these policies, this calculation looks completely different. And that's another reason I really, it, it, we've got to be careful about how we interpret these. We can say something about what we can measure. And so in the paper, we say, okay, here's the cost difference. You know, it may be that the benefits or costs that we haven't measured fully rationalize those benefits, that, that gap, um, but that's sort of without of the realm. So I couldn't agree more, and we need to be careful about sort of the spillovers and effects and innovation, et cetera, that we're not able to capture with these sort of short-run models. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yes, there are studies in Britain looking at the offshore wind turbines, mm -hmm. and the price has fallen by 50% in the last two years, yep. and that is due to the scale. And it's quite easy to take account of those, Meredith. I think mm -hmm. one, one shouldn't pan these by using data that are completely out of date relative mm -hmm. to the actual structure, because mm -hmm. now solar, it's second least expensive in Britain, mm -hmm. but, and onshore wind is the least expensive, yep. and that's even without the dynamic reductions mm -hmm. that will follow. Yep. No, I, sh I should be clear. So this slide was provocative. It worked. I mean, I think that uh, when we wrote the paper, <laughs> it was, you know, these are the benefits of cost we can measure. And if we're looking at these sharp and marginal benefits, this is what it looks like. But, in the, you know, there are any number of benefits that we can't capture here. And, you know, they could easily or they could potentially offset the cost difference that we're documenting here. So thank you for elevating that point. 
Okay, we've got some microphones up upstairs too, so maybe let's collect a couple of questions. Raise your hand if you're, or down here, if you, yes. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, in your uh, map, what's the difference between, I mean, what's the meaning of the blue and the green area? Yeah, the, um, let me make sure I get my facts right. One is carbon tax, uh, the blue is carbon tax regimes, and the green is cap and trade programs. Uh, regarding uh, the threshold for inclusion in a cap mm -hmm. and trade system, so given that enforcement is costly, have you come across literature that determines an optimal threshold for mm -hmm. inclusion in the cap and trade system? Because full inclusion would probably be prohibitively expensive, completely ruining any welfare benefit. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, it's not an area I'm familiar with. I know that those thresholds were based on administrative costs, it get, if you get pretty small, the costs of drawing you into the program outweigh the benefits, but I'm personally not aware of work that's thought about optimizing those thresholds. Although we have tried to convince, failed, convince a policymaker to put a threshold in a particularly sort of dense area of the data, <laughs> so we'd have more control and treatment uh, facilities on the other side of the data, but apparently our research design priorities were trumped by other considerations. Meredith, I, I think we had one up in the gallery. Thomas, yeah. Thanks for your, your talk. It was really great. Um, I just uh, sort of a bit of, I guess my message is curb your enthusiasm. Uh, yep. the, the CG models are great, but they're just one, you know, the fact that you cover all the dates, the points doesn't mean that it's, it is a number, it's not the number, right? So it's, and I, I like the way that you began with empirical work, and I think there really is a need for work on empirically informed estimates. These. Oh. These as you pointed out in the survey piece by Nick and, uh, mm -hmm. and Jared, the, the, the CG models that are based on so off-the-shelf CRTS models are all in the same neighborhood, but mm -hmm. if you bring in more modern sort of industrial organization-based, the yep. type model, then the intuition, the number goes up a lot, and yep. I think that's not the end of the story on what the estimates are. That's right, that's right. And I will plug a paper by Nick Rivers, who, uh, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you ran a CGE model in Canada and tried to empirically validate it um, using information, you know, using an, uh, sort of ex post, uh, and I think more work like that is great uh, to try and uh, get at the issues you raise. Okay. We have a question from a non-economist. Christian Azar. Uh, hi, I'm Christian Azar from um, Chalmers University of Technology here in Gothenburg. Uh, I just wanted to add, uh, I really liked your presentation. It was clear and, uh, and, and you came out with a number of very good messages. Uh, I was a bit concerned though with the solar and wind uh, comparison that Thomas already mentioned. Uh, the first reason of which uh, it was problematic is that of course those policies did not only the, the aim of those policies was not only to reduce uh, CO2 emissions, but also to reduce the cost of solar and wind. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I, I and many others have been struggling with economists for a long time uh, about what is the real intention of those policies. And, and economists have tended to be sort of uh, very focused on the fact that they were only aimed to reduce the emissions. Mm -hmm. uh, Thomas mentioned one thing with the technology development impact. I want to mention three other aspects which I think come close to what you were talking about later on in the, in the presentation. I think one of uh, the other reasons for uh, being in favor of those policies were that they reduced the risk of carbon leakage. Because mm -hmm. when they introduced uh, those policies, the cost of electricity dropped, which was beneficial for the electricity intensive industries, and the cost of carbon permits dropped too, so the, the risk that companies would actually move out uh, dropped, and those things are very rarely considered when, when economists do these sort of kind of static analysis. Um, the other aspect too is that when, when one sets up a carbon and cap and trade scheme, uh, one tends to think that okay, we set the target and things are fine, and the purpose of the economist is to find the least cost way of reaching that particular target. Mm -hmm. But what we are like mainly struggling with is to make sure that the target as such goes as far as down as possible. And I think policymakers are really concerned with setting it to a stringent target, because then you know, it might cost unemployment, reduce reduction in growth, etc. Mm -hmm. So they tend to set a too lenient target, but when they add these complement, complementary policies, they reduce the carbon uh, price in the, in the trading system, uh, which makes it possible to, in the next round, 
set more stringent targets, so they sort of become helpful in actually making sure that the targets become closer to where we need to, to be. And then the, the last point I'm dragging on here, I'm sorry, is that when you develop these technologies, you uh, make it cheaper for countries in China, Africa, India, etc., who are not part of the sort of willing coalition to reduce their own targets at a lower cost so they might come on and do something. So, and if one would have only relied on cap and trade and no other policies, we would have gone from coal to gas and no one outside Europe yeah. would have said, oh, that's sexy, you're going to solve the climate problem. <laughs> yeah. But now yeah. sort of, yeah. Thank I you agree. very much. I agree. And much. I guess I should be clear. Um, I think that the work that we're doing to look at short run costs is a part of the fuller picture. I could not agree more with what you, so California is less than 1% of global emissions. So we should not be focused exclusively on reducing our own emissions. We need to prioritize on moving ahead on technologies we can export and policy solutions we can export. So I agree. And I think one of my messages is our, when economists focus too much on cost effectiveness, we're not as constructive as we potentially could be to the policy debate, so I agree. But I do think there's a place for the kinds of studies that measures what costs and benefits we can easily measure, so long as those studies are very careful to interpret, you know, this is a partial piece of the puzzle, and the gap could be rationalized by benefits and costs we failed to capture in this particular paper. So I think we're on the same page. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me, let's squeeze in one last question from Micha Rausch. Yeah, thank you very much. I liked this talk very much. It was uh, very comprehensive, but I missed something, which is a, another mechanism of leakage, which goes through the fossil fuels market. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so if we uh, reduce our emissions or our use of fossil fuels, then the price will go down and other countries will increase the demand. And the policy implication of this would be that we should reduce our domestic production of fossil fuels, and many countries are doing just the opposite thing, and this frightens me. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think I can state what's happening, which is not right, which is the, these leakage mitigation policies focus exclusively on the trade channel and sort of maybe not ignore, but don't attempt to address the fuel price channel. I think that is a blind spot because many of the CG models, which may be flawed, um, do predict that that fuel price channel is a really important one. So I think it's another uh, blind spot we should elevate the importance of when we're thinking about leakage mitigating policy, although that's easier said than done in terms of thinking about how to strike the right balance with an output-based subsidy or a, or a border tax adjustment. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Many things I couldn't have said better myself. Let's thank Meredith. OK, now there's lunch back at Handel's. And don't forget your editorial board meetings.